Friends, Romans, countrymen, lend me your ears. No, really, I've not been doing very well lately, so any ears that you might have, if you could just pass the basket, just put it in, pass it to the next person, and then as soon as my paycheck comes in, Now that I have your ears, thank you, I would like to whisper sweet nothings about a little board game I like called Caesar! Seize Rome in 20 minutes. An absolutely ridiculous title with a pun so bad that even I refuse to play with it. But whilst I'm here, let me highlight the absolute best part of that title, which is 20 minutes. Because you know how long this game takes? That's right, it's 20 minutes. What's that? A board game that takes as long as it says on the box? That's right, it's 20 minutes. 20 minutes. <sighs> 20 minutes. I don't know if you noticed, but I'm quite enamored with the length of this game, which is 20 minutes. That's because I have a lot of time for a game that takes 20 minutes. Actually, I have exactly 20 minutes. Length, of course, isn't everything. I don't mean that in a naughty way, I just didn't have another way to express that concept. And I lost my trail of thought now. Length isn't everything. Colonoscopies also take about 20 minutes and you don't exactly see me saying to the doctor, can we play again? Let me assuage your fears. Caesar sees Rome in 20 minutes is just about the best 20 minutes you can spend playing a board game that takes 20 minutes. Talking of colonoscopies, before I extol the virtues of Caesar sees Rome in 20 minutes, a terse two-player tactical battle that feels smart, clever, inventive, and just so darn great to play, first we have to broach the uncomfortable subject of how this game looks. I'm not even gonna try and defend it. If you like your games pretty and won't have it any other way, there's nothing I can say or do to convince you that Caesar sees Rome in 20 minutes is a game you should add to your collection. The cardboard feels cheap, the bags are made from a material that can only be explained by someone deliberately ordering the world's least pleasant fabric, and the art, well, but I'm still gonna say try and look past that because Caesar is really good. In Caesar, you'll take on the role of either Caesar, perhaps the most famous Italian man, or his arch nemesis Pompey, full name Gnaeus Pompeius Magnus. No matter which side you'll play, you'll get one unpleasant to touch cloth bag, an identical set of round cardboard influence tokens that are equally unpleasant to touch, that you will then put into the unpleasant to touch cloth bag, and as the game progresses, you will put your hand into the unpleasant to touch cloth bag multiple times, and draw the unpleasant to touch influence tokens. When the game begins, you will only have two influence tokens, tucked away secretly behind your screen, and then each turn you will place one of these tokens onto the map, contributing towards your campaign to seize Rome. Aha, you might ask, but what do I need to do to actually seize Rome and win the game? Well, that's where things get a touch tricky and very interconnected. Also at the start of the game, you will receive 12 control tokens. By winning battles on the map, you will be able to place them on conquered regions. The first to get rid of all of their control tokens wins the game. The key phrase here being get rid of, because as the tides of war turn, some of your control tokens might get swept away. But in terms of winning the game, that doesn't matter. Each token removed from this area contributes 112 towards your victory, whether it's on the board or not. You, you just want that ear, don't you? You want the people's ears. Can we just get the dog one of the ears? Thank you, thank you. Do you want this? I'm gonna have to pay people back, but if you want it, you can have it. Confused? Don't worry, I got you. 
Let's look at how you place influence tokens first. Whenever it's your turn, you can place any ones you have behind your screen onto the borders of these regions. Each influence token has a symbol, perhaps swords or shields or maybe navy. You can place an influence token onto a space that has a matching symbol unless you have a token garnished with some bay leaves. Much like bay itself, it can be placed anywhere. Thematic and tasty. You will however notice that the token itself is split into two and each side features a numerical value, sometimes identical, sometimes different. And that's because when you place the token, you place it onto the border of two different regions. Each value will contribute military strength to the region it's facing and of course how you orient the token is up to you. Which already offers a delicious pickle. If let's say I have an influence token with six swords on one side and nil on the other, if I place it here, which of these territories am I willing to throw all my strength towards and which one I'm willing to neglect. If that sounds interesting, buckle up, things are about to get better. If by placing an influence token, I fully enclose a region with influence tokens, then that region is scored. And whoever has the highest total on influence tokens facing towards that region will win it and get to place their control marker onto it. That right there is already a game, perhaps even an exciting one, weighing up where to focus your forces, which region deserves more of your attention. Do you want to instigate fights all the way on the other side of the map, or do you want to focus on what you think is a key region? Do you want to snap territories that require only a scant three influence tokens to surround, or do you want an all-out war for Italia, which requires significant investment and attention, but rewards you with not one, but two control token placements. And that is already one sixth of your victory right there. Or maybe you can fight for Italia in a different way, instigating battles adjacent to it, but always peppering a token that shares a border with Italia. That way, hopefully winning battles outside and eventually within. But in all of this, you might be noticing a flaw, a quirk, one poorly chosen herb that doesn't quite gel. Let's say that Caesar places one of their tokens right here, and then the turn goes to Pompey, and Pompey could put up a fight and put one of their tokens into the region as well, but why would they? They would be fighting against Caesar's potential two tokens with just one of theirs. And if they do do that, then the turn goes back to Caesar. And not only do they get to finish this area, but also they know exactly how many forces they need to contribute to win. So then my only real choice is to not get involved at all, which makes this about as good a game of conflict as playing dodgeball with a solo variant. The whole thing just devolves into each player placing token by token into their own little regions. It's just not fun. Okay, let me tell you how this really works. There's one more thing that happens when control for the area is assessed. Whoever places the influence token that encloses the region and trigger scoring gets a bonus regardless of whether they win the region or not. And these bonuses, they have to be good enough to deliberately want to lose a region. So for example, if I enclosed a region with this scroll bonus, I would get the scroll and that grants me an extra turn. Imagine if this was chess and then you take your turn and then you immediately get another turn. That's good, right? It's not just good, it's interesting because it opens up this space to be a play field instead of abstract lines on a piece of cardboard. Now you can finagle situations like, for example, deliberately losing a region, but then you get an extra turn. But with the same token you've placed, you're empowering another region. And then because you have an extra turn, you get to place yet another token, this time winning the region and getting the bonus. And once again, 
getting an extra turn. And that is just one of the four bonuses. You can also permanently increase the size of your influence token limit, dislodge more control tokens from your supply, and even flip other tokens face down, the importance of which I'll elaborate on later. I'm making this all sound very clever, and it is, but it's important to acknowledge that Caesar is not a very strategic game. Turn by turn, you only have two tokens to choose from, and those tokens dictate which battles you can engage in and which ones you can't. Even the Bayleaf wild tokens aren't as versatile as they initially seem because whilst they do let you place a token anywhere, their values are generally pretty low on both sides, leaving you in a situation which is never quite perfect. Caesar is reactive tactical and pivoting the game into the direction you want it to go into requires more than willpower and that can-do attitude, but it never stops being clever because all these options and pathways remain a conscious possibility, so even if you haven't quite got the right token to pull your plan off, with the right draw, you might just get there. Which does make Caesar somewhat reliant on luck, but never in a way that feels punishing or unfair. Instead, it just wants you to go with the flow because there's always an avenue, always an opportunity. There's so much scope to become familiar and intimate with this design that you're less inclined to blame it and you just wanna dig deeper and deeper and then bam, 20 minutes are done. Can we play again? Not so fast, there's just this one little cruel twist that pretty much cements Caesar into a classic two-player banger. Now, I don't know about you, but this whole thing doesn't exactly scream ancient Rome to me, which is fine, this is a two-player short abstract game, the setting is just that, set dressing, but once again, I want something that makes the area I play on in games of conflict feel a little bit more Alive. I want the map to have features and personality, and so far this just looks like black lines with questionable graphic design. Also, I want a touch of variance, so I'm not just replaying the same puzzle over and over again. If I didn't need those things, I'd be playing chess. And I'm not knocking chess here, it's just that so much of chess is already mapped out, and the joy of it is from getting better and making the right moves, whereas the joy of Caesar comes from just playing it and making cool moves. The variance and personality are both achieved by the bonus tokens being randomly distributed each time you play, which is a nice touch, but also by this wonderful little rule. If you have a control token on a region and then you win a region adjacent to it, you also get to place an extra control token in between those regions. And now I hope you can see why flipping tokens face down is so neat, which you achieve by winning this bonus. If your opponent is winning region after region after region and just emptying their bank of control tokens, this could literally stop them dead in their tracks. What this brings to the game is this sense of tug, with one player always leading the charge, pointing to new battlefields and areas of tension, and the other reacting, which is obviously not a great place to be. So if you're player two or Pompey, you're constantly fighting to unseat Caesar from dictating flow of the game. And if you're Caesar, you're trying to make Pompey to spread themselves too thin into too many directions. Unless of course, Pompey flips the state and then the roles become reversed. Ed two, Pompey. At two. And that's the thing you see, you're not playing a puzzle, although you can if you want to, there's an included solo mode, you're playing against your arch nemesis, John Pompey, embodied by the dweeb sitting next to you or opposite you. Hopefully you know that dweeb, you know what they want, what they like, you're not playing Caesar, you're playing against them in a game of Caesar. Thank you. It's so nice that this design recognizes that and caters to different playstyles with these four very different bonus token abilities. If you know your opponent, if you know what will likely entice them, you can tug on their heartstrings, set little traps, make them fight for regions and waste resources that you don't care about. And that's just the tip of it. There's a gentle touch of math that is never overwhelming because each regular influence token always adds up to six on both sides. The distribution of influence tokens is also identical, so you can do things like weigh up the odds of whether the opponent can steal 
a region from you, whether they have ships in their hand, for example. You can dig so deep. If I had one big criticism of Caesar, seize Rome in 20 minutes, is the ending. There's never a big reveal, there's no clever move that clenches the game. One player, over the course of 20 minutes, will eventually just work themselves in a situation of no outs, no good placements. No matter what token you put down, you know it's curtains. This isn't a curtain, that's a bed sheet. And whilst I did have a few games and on one player relying on getting a little lucky, needing their opponent to not have the right token to seal the deal, it was mostly just a fading sad hope rather than a momentous plot twist. But it doesn't matter because there's already been plenty of clever moves over the course of 20 minutes and it all comes back to this, 20 minutes. Caesar is so easy to teach, so quick to set up, so comfortable to slide into that you just can't get enough of it. Honestly, if I didn't have other board games to review, I might have just slipped into a Caesar coma, gradually becoming more and more a leafy salad and every 20 minutes I'd wake up to say one thing and one thing only, more Caesar, Caesar Rome in 20 minutes. Which brings us to one final awkward elephant in the Senate. Turns out that Caesar, Caesar Rome in 20 minutes is the second in a line of games that I shall now dub as uh, 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 uh in 20 minutes. The first one being called Blitzkrieg, World War II in 20 minutes. Awkwardly, this doesn't have an exclamation mark after 20 minutes and this one does, so I don't know what to do about that. I think some folk might already be familiar with this game as it got some strong reviews in the few years since it's been released, but I'm coming at this from a strange angle. See, I played Caesar before I played Blitzkrieg and I gotta admit, working my way backwards was kinda weird. Not as weird as that opening sketch with the ears, but it's still weird. Blitzkrieg is a meatier game and potentially a deeper game. Where Caesar has four different special abilities to learn, its predecessor has seven different special tokens and nine different bonuses you can get by placing tokens, which is a slog. I'm not gonna say this game isn't any good because I think it's pretty great actually, but I think that this achieves about 90% of the depth of Blitzkrieg with about 40% of the rules. And if a friend came along and I wanted to show them a cool little game that didn't take a lot of time or brain space, would I teach them this and pester them to remember 16 different abilities and then ask them whether they want to play the Allies or the Axis, or would I just show them this and potentially get a better result out of it? It's just so great to get a sequel that doesn't just add things onto a good statue to make it look misshapen and lumpy, but instead chisels it to reveal an even better statue underneath. I think Caesar is a really great achievement, a triumph, and I have a lot of time for it. Specifically, 20 minutes, but maybe times 100. And that's it, that's the video for Caesar, Caesar Rome in 20 minutes, done. And you might ask, what do I do with myself now? Well, the obvious answer is to, of course, subscribe and watch all of the other No Pun Included videos. But what if I watched every single one, you might ask? Well, in that case, the situation is actually very simply resolved by me recommending another person you could go and watch, which is something I've been doing over the last year, uh, but sort of paused on that, but I'm now returning to that. So this is back and I'm recommending other people and you should go watch them because I think they're all great. And in today's video, I'm recommending Taylor's Trick Taking Table, hosted by Taylor, sometimes known as Trick and sometimes known as Table. What Taylor does, or Trick or Table, is sometimes, not sometimes, sorry, always, tells you about only trick taking games. And what's cool about that is that not only does Taylor have an immense knowledge of trick taking games and what makes them good or what makes them bad or whatever, but also just, just a dearth of games that I've never even heard of. And you know, he'll be like, oh, this is Flugengook. And you know, it's obviously a German classic trick taking game that people have been playing for 40 years. And I'm like, what? I've never heard of it. But he knows all about it. And what's also great is that when you have someone who delves exclusively into one genre, you find some really neat, innovative 
twists on the concept. I recommend watching Taylor's review on shamans, which is trick taking with social deduction, or Ghosts of Christmas, which is trick taking with time travel, right? That sounds cool. So those are the two hooks. You can go watch those. I'll leave the links in the description and enjoy Taylor, please, everybody. Uh, and also visit patreon.com slash no pun included uh, because we need money. Uh, I might have accidentally borrowed too many years and I need to pay people back for those. And there's inflation and everything. So if you could just go and donate, I would be able to pay for the ears.